Hello, I'm Father Gregory Pine, and it's great to have you again for another installment of Off Campus Conversations. Uh, as you've become accustomed to hear, we have these every two weeks on the Thomistic Institute podcast, and the hope is that we would follow up with the Thomistic Institute speaker and then deepen some of the insights which were introduced in the course of the talk or lecture on campus, whether, you know, like a campus lecture or a particular Thomistic Institute conference or intellectual retreat. So today I'm very delighted to be joined by Professor Matthew Dugancic. So thanks so much for joining us on Off Campus Conversations. Sure, absolutely. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I am, my name is Matthew Dugancic. I work uh, here at St. Mary's Seminary University, America's first Catholic seminary. I teach moral theology and I serve here as the academic dean. And my research focuses on Aquinas and in particular his theory of the passions, but I'm also happy to talk about the existence of God. <laughs> this pleases me. I too am happy to talk about the existence of God. Um, and the existence of God is especially pertinent because you recently gave a lecture at Harvard University on the existence of God, and it's on that lecture, or it's pursuant to that lecture that we are following up. So, okay, in listening to that lecture, you described in large part the first way which St. Thomas says, well, loose translation is the most straightforward way. Most manifest, uh, yeah. <laughs> there it is, manifestissimus. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and then you supplemented with some parallel insights from the second way, insofar maybe as efficient causality is something that uh, people have a little more kind of 21st century sympathy for. So I, th I thought that maybe we'd just take the opportunity to deepen some of the distinctions that you drew in the course of that conversation, because you start with the claim, listen, if you really take the time and invest in understanding what St. Thomas is saying, and then how these arguments are articulated, it becomes a lot clearer. Because for some people who first see the five ways, they take them at face value, they maybe don't do the work to excavate um, like the mine of jewels, which lays beneath. And they're like, yeah, not really convincing. Atheism, rah, rah, sis, boom, bah, if they're like cheerleaders <laughs> from the 80s. Yeah. Um, so may maybe if you, just by way of introduction, kind of lead us into the metaphysical thought world, which uh, which is behind this first way. Just, you know, we'll get into the particular definitions of the particular concepts, but maybe just some first steps when approaching the first way. Sure. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll, there are two things I think that are important to say in response to that. Uh, when approaching Aquinas on the on any of the five ways, really, uh, the first is that Aquinas really intended this to be for people who are already pretty acquainted with a certain philosophical system. Uh, and the second is that uh, with with respect to that system, I don't really think that he would have thought that anyone would, in that, who was reading his work would find the conclusion surprising. So it's not written for a 20th century audience, and it's not written for, uh, it's really not written for an atheist. Um, but it does, so then you might wonder, well, then what the heck did he write these things for? And the answer is, well, each of the five ways helps you understand something about God. And helps you, uh, it, 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 he refers back to the five ways, uh, later, uh, so, you know, it, it, as, as a reminder showing that various attributes of God can be shown when you consider all things in light of God, which is what the five ways do. So if you, if you, like the first way is an art, is an argument from motion or change. And the conclusion is not just that God exists, but it also shows you very clearly that God is changeless. And, you know, God is eternal. And you, when you, when you go over the first way, that becomes very clear. And that's really one of the points of the first way. The second thing is, um, uh, not only does Aquinas, uh, presume a certain philosophic familiarity with a certain philosophical system, uh, but he also isn't, isn't, he's, he's trying to prove the existence of what we might call a primary being, which he thinks everyone uh, would call God taken for granted, but we, but people are often confused when they hear the, the five ways, because when you get to the conclusion, they go, wait a second, you haven't gotten to a Trinity. Uh, you haven't gotten to a personal and loving God. And it's true. You haven't. So you have to be clear. I guess you have to manage expectations when doing the, the five ways. Okay. So I'm thinking that there's a particular disposition of the individual practitioner who approaches these, who reads these, who does work on these, and I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to go ahead and describe it as a kind of contemplative disposition. So it seems like the the type of inquiry that's rewarded when reading the five ways is a contemplative inquiry. 
So like Aristotle famously says that contemplation of highest things, even if only momentary, affords greatest delights. So the 21st century probably needs to be convicted as to the efficacy of contemplation just from the get-go, but we'll pass over that. Um, when, when it comes to the five ways, um, you know, like what are the contemplative dispositions of looking at this particular argument or like kind of gazing upon this particular reality. So you said, all right, so we're, we're, we're kind of getting different vantages on God. And certainly as we follow up, you know, this occurs in question two of the Prima Bars, as we follow up in question three through 11, we're going to suss out the details of the God whom we have kind of got purchase on. That sounds so crass, but the God whom we have come to know through the five ways that he's simple, that he's perfect, that he's good, et cetera, at Ali Hu's Modi. Um, but like, yes, maybe, maybe describe some of the contemplative habits of a person who wants to appreciate these things, but maybe doesn't yet. I actually, I think I'm in a, in a relatively good disposition to do that. And the reason is because I started out life, uh, I'm a recovering biologist, you know, <laughs> uh, I, I majored in biology in undergrad and I, at, at the age of, I think, 23, I read Aquinas's De Ante Ad Essentia and just thought it was hogwash. I thought it made no sense at all. This is just stupid nonsense. And I got mad because I thought that meant that like the, the major philosopher of the, of the Catholic faith was just making up silly things. I read it again last year because I was teaching a course here at St. Mary's that we were calling Metaphysics for, the for Theology. And uh, I reread the Ante Ad Essentia and was just astounded at how brilliant it is. But really, the difference between my disposition now and my disposition then was affected in large part by reading Aristotle. And one of the things that really surprised me when I first read Aristotle was just how confident he was that we could know things. Mm. Because the, the modern mindset is one of skepticism. And you don't really, uh, if, if the modern mind does not really acknowledge what, what Aristotle or Aquinas would call formal causality or final causality, um, and you know, they, they, they focus instead rather on material causality and efficient causality. So, you know, you can, so there's matter, sure. And it can be manipulated also, sure. But, uh, if you, if you don't acknowledge the reality of formal causality, then all, all different things, uh, all the things that you encounter in the world are just various combinations and recombinations of matter. And uh, nothing really exists for anything. Nothing has any inherent purpose. But Aristotle just kind of thinks it's obvious that things are, in fact, more than just what they appear to be materially, and they have purposes. And it's it's there's a kind of shift, I think, that takes place in your mind when you start to think, you know what, maybe he's right. Uh, and there, I don't know that there's any simple way to prove that that's the case. I think it's more that when you get habitually inclined to thinking along his lines, more things make sense and you start to adopt that position. But really, I think one of the dispositions that you need in order to, um, to approach the five ways, especially way number four, is to think about things, uh, as, as to, to think about things in more than just material terms. So I like this image of Aristotle as confident <clears throat> and as and of St. Thomas Aquinas as kind of sharing in his confidence, maybe even a bolstered confidence by virtue of the fact that he knows by a testimony greater than his own. Um, and I think, yeah, it, it helps me to draw the connection between problems in epistemology and problems in metaphysics. So like the 21st century isn't very confident that things can be known, which is fascinating. Um, and I think part of that is because the 21st century has given up on the intelligibility of reality. You think about our primary modes of discourse in the 21st century, it's like mockery, scorn, outrage, irony, suasion, protest, unmasking. It's all parasitic. It's not really a consideration of like, what's at stake and how can I access it? It's, it's more so a consideration of like, what do I want done and how can I manipulate things ready at hand in order to achieve my felt purposes? Um, so yeah, just this idea that, that reality itself is intelligible and its intelligibility is an intelligibility which is on loan, uh, to speak somewhat poetically, from God, and that if you get into the nitty gritty of that, that you arrive at God. So, I mean, yeah, just thinking about the contemplative disposition to think about, you know, most, most listeners are, are Christian, they're going to think about it in terms of a, a theology of creation, that things present themselves as intelligible, and because they're intelligible, they're knowable. And because they're knowable, we can make strides or steps, you know, in addressing from whom they come and who he is. Which is, I mean, when it comes to revolutionary claims, that's like way up there in 2022. Holy smokes. Okay. 
Um, all right. So maybe in, in an effort to, you know, perform a, a, a corporate act of conceptual therapy as we try to reclaim the 21st century mind from the skepticism to which it has fallen prey, we can think a little bit about the concepts that St. Thomas uses. And the big ones that you uh, pick out in the course of the conversation because of the big ones that St. Thomas uses are like motion and then the kind of causality that's involved and then it, what it means to be um, what, what, what we're describing when we, when we arrive at the God who is the source of that causality, who is not dependent upon some prior cause for his own intelligibility. So maybe motion. Okay. So people think all things, well, all manner of things when it comes to motion. What's at stake when we talk about motion and how does St. Thomas use that? What is at stake when we talk about motion? Um, well, I think that if we're, if we're, if we're asking the question in view of like, what does Aquinas mean by that vis-a-vis what does a 21st century person mean by that? Uh, and then what is at stake in the difference between those, those two approaches to it? Uh, motion for a 21st century mind is, is really just change in place. And change itself, I don't really think is a thick or a deep concept for the 21st century mind. I mean, maybe we're all just kind of like Heraclitus. Things are, things just change. It just, it just happens. And I don't, you know, there's no order to it. Uh, but change for Aquinas is a very clear, uh, concept. And when you think about various examples of change, it, it becomes more and more clear that his definition of change, which he borrows from Aristotle, is correct, and that's the reduction of potency to act. So there are things, and there are not things. Things are there are things that exist, and there are plenty of things that don't exist. But not all non-existence is alike. Non-existence is 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 something is something real for Aristotle and and for and for Aquinas. In fact, in his Metaphysics, Aristotle actually says that non-being is in a sense being because when we say that something is nothing, we're saying that it is nothing. Um, and I love that about Aristotle because he's just there's that confidence right there. He just, that, that's his proof that, that non-being is something. It just, well, you said so, <laughs> you know, it is. Um, and so, uh, not all, not, not all non-being is alike. And what that means is that, uh, if, 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 if I'm, do you think of anything you want, you know, if I'm thinking of a house, for example, um, a pile of rocks is more likely to become a house, more able to become a house than a single pebble is. And so when we talk, and, and Aquinas is a word for this ability of things to be otherwise than they are is potency. And so potency describes how something uh, can give rise to something else that doesn't exist. And when we think about the way something is, it becomes clear to us what other things that thing could be and what things it can't be. So potency is something, even though it describes things that aren't actually in existence. It's nevertheless something real about things. Uh, so the reduction of potency to act basically means that if X changes to Y, then X had the potential to become Y. And that's pretty straightforward. That's, that's almost a tautology. And you can, th- any, you can think of any examples uh, you want. You know, a, a, a cold pot on the stove is potentially warm. A glass on a table is potentially a pile of shards on the floor what have you. Uh, but the key trick for Aquinas, uh, the, the key uh, logical step that you have to take is that these, these potencies are made to be real. They're brought into actuality by something that already has actuality. So the, the uh, simple way of putting this, the straightforward way of putting this is that nothing changes itself for Aquinas. So thinking about this particular distinction or this description of um, motion or change, as you have laid it out, I think that m- maybe one of the hurdles for a 21st century mind is that uh, I think a lot of people hear like there's some imperfect causers and then somehow you arrive at a perfect causer. Um, but the idea is like there's some like weak causes and then you get to a strong cause where I think where you where you began, you know, early in the conversation talking about that the God at whom we arrive by this proof is an immutable God right? To think about it more in terms of mutability or even like volatility. Um, And again, that brings you back to this consideration of the intelligibility of being. Like there are some things which are just less fixed, less certain, less stable in their being, right? Their their being is subject to change, right? Um, And then 
by reasoning through the causal arrangements that obtain among these things, you arrive at the source from whence comes their being. And I think that that, that has to you know, challenge a notion of it's like we're dealing with imperfect causes and then we arrive at a perfect causes because it's se- a perfect cause because then it seems like a sleight of hand. And you made reference to the arguments of, you know, like, uh, I guess, Dawkins and maybe Hitchens who said like, well, you know, if you arrive at this godlike thing, this flying yeah. spaghetti monster, um, then what causes him? But that's right. to miss the point, right? Because right. it's not just a matter of, you know, train cars pulling each other or something like that. There's something else to say. I don't know if you want to say something about that. The connection there with intelligibility and then change and what that avails us. Yeah, um, well, I guess you were talking about, I, I used the term stronger and weaker causes. Uh, I, I think the key to understanding this proof in particular is dependence. In other words, there's it's, it's not just the case that there's one great cause and then a whole bunch of weaker causes. Uh, it's rather the case that there are, sorry, one you know great changer and a whole bunch of other changers. It's rather the case that there are uh, agents of change, agents that make that ch- affect change in the world, but that every single one of those agents depends on something else for its causal efficacy. Nothing in the world that changes other things is able to change things by its own power without depending on something else that is prior to it in the order of being. So this leads into the distinction that you drew in the course of the talk, the difference between an accidentally subordinated series of causes and then an essentially subordinated series of causes. The, the example that you used for accidentally subordinated series of causes was, you know, parents and children. You said, you know, I was caused by my mom. She was caused by her mom. But I don't need my grandmother to remain living in order for me to engender children, right? Because my cause as a parent isn't dependent upon all of the causality that has gone before me that can pass and i'm still invested with this whereas there's something else going uh or there's something else going on i suppose in a in an essentially subordinated series of causes um insofar as that isn't something that we ordinarily think about as readily what what is at stake there or what's going on with an essentially subordinated series of causes yeah so with an essentially subordinated a series of causes each member of the causal chain depends on each prior member for its own causal efficacy uh, and and in, an, in an accidentally ordered series of causes, they don't. So I mean, I don't know. For example, in addition to the the parents' example, like um, let's see, uh, if I were to if I were cold in my I'm not I'm actually going through a heat wave right now, which is absolutely unbearable. But let's just say it were cold, and I were to start a uh, a fire in a fireplace, which I don't have, and then uh, someone were to sneak in when I wasn't looking and light a torch with that fire and then run over to a building and, and burn it down. I wouldn't be responsible for arson uh, because I, that, you know, once, once the flame leaves my office, it no longer depends on the fire that's here that it came from. So it, at one point was dependent and now it isn't. But in a, in a per se ordered uh, uh, series of causes, each, each uh, cause in the chain is, is, dependent for its cause, it, de- it depends on the prior uh, causes for its causal efficacy. So I think the example that I used in the talk was a train. No, no car on a train pulls itself or moves itself. They all, each, each one pulls each other and each one is able to pull another because it is self being pulled and eventually there's a locomotive and that's how you know that there's a locomotive pulling the whole train. Um, another, uh, let's see, another example might be... Um, like all of the all of the tools involved in in making an art a, a, a painting a work of art, uh, there's a painter, but then the painter uses paint and the painter uses a brush and uh, uh, nothing in that you know even the, the brushes don't put paint on canvas themselves. They need a hand and a hand needs an arm to move it and so on and so forth. And the thing about per se ordered uh, uh, causal series is not only that each member of the chain depends on each prior member for its causal efficacy. It also has certain characteristics about it. Uh, for example, um, a painter uh, clearly is an agent in making a work of art, and he makes he uses a variety of tools that all depend on him for their causal efficacy. Uh, but there's a sort of uh, 
like the image that comes to mind when you think about this is a pyramid. There is an agent that causes X, that causes Y, that causes Z, and the causal efficacy kind of branches out from him. You, a better example might even be a general commanding foot soldiers, but his command passes from, you know, it goes from the general to a sergeant, to a platoon, to, to the soldiers who then execute it. And the difference, uh, the difference between a general uh, commanding soldiers and uh, me lighting a fire in my fireplace is that while I am not responsible for the arson that was committed as a result of the fire that I lit, a general is responsible for whatever his soldiers are doing on the battlefield insofar as they're obeying his commands. So you can see that in a per se ordered series, uh, each member and th there's there's a there's a much tighter and immediate connection among all of the members of the series, and they all originate in some uh, master cause, as it were, upon which everything in the series depends for its own efficacy. Yeah, yeah. It's again kind of like linking it back to a theology of creation. Um, I was working recently on this text from the De Potentia three. Uh, it was either Article seven or Article eight where St. Thomas is describing the ways in which, you know, God is said to be creator, or the ways in which we rely upon God. And he talks about how we rely upon God for our being, but also for our causing, and that we rely upon God further for our conservation and being and our conservation of causing, which is a fascinating thing, this idea that our causality is itself like a further note of our created status or a further feature of our created status, and that that causality isn't just like a wind it up and set it in motion type thing but that we receive a constant causal influx from God. Um, you know, and like we're talking about the first way, but when you think about this in terms of its spiritual applications, you know, it's, it's very concrete applications in terms of the life of prayer. You don't ever like master prayer and then wander away from God, right? You always are receiving the capacity and then the act of prayer. And I think about that one preference where it's like even the desire to praise you is itself your gift. Um, which I think, again, it's something that we don't make conscious advertence to too terribly often. Maybe it's because our, our kind of principal paradigm in the 21st century for causality is, you know, you hit the cue ball and the cue ball hits the seven ball and the seven ball hits the whatever, eight ball into the corner pocket. When truth be told, what we're talking about here is, you know, it's just a, it's a, it's another kind of causal arrangement. Um, okay, so as we, as we follow this, you know, per se, subordinated series of causes or essentially subordinated series causes back to its source. One of the key things that you described at a couple of points now is this idea that a thing can't actualize itself, right? A thing can't reduce itself from potency to act, you know, to speak improperly, but cutely. A thing can't pull itself up by its own metaphysical bootstraps. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, and you, you made reference in the talk to the fact that when it, things seems to do that, it's probably like one part causing another part. Um, and certainly I'm sure that, that physicists have all kinds of examples that they think are real stumpers, but maybe to help people appreciate that better, do you have some examples ready at hand or some ways in which to clarify that principle further? Yeah, I can think about that a bit. I, I just, but I, I think what you said before was, was also, um, illuminating and, and helpful for answering your very first question, which was, well, why does Aquinas even, you know, come up with these five ways and how should we look at them and so on? I, when you were talking about, our the derivative status of our causal efficacy. Um, I think that that's really important for the spiritual life for people to understand that. I I I I think that I I personally made great a great leap forward in my. Uh, I was reading socialist texts this morning for Catholic social teaching, so there's the great leap forward. But it doesn't it doesn't apply to that at all. That's not how I mean it. I made a great advance in uh, my own spiritual life when I remember listening to a homily where the priest said that. Um, you know, when you start to grow in holiness, don't ever think to yourself that now you're don't need the crutches of prayer anymore, that you're just you, you are yourself holy. And so you have the strength within you that you can use to combat sin. That's not how holiness works at all. We simply grow to rely more on God. And uh, this the first way really helps you understand just how much all the things that you do are dependent on God. Uh, I, I, so I think, I think that's a, like the, the proofs are not just fun to have internet debates with, with atheists on Reddit. Like there, there's, there's real import to these things. Um, so anyway, the question was, well, okay, the, one of the key claims in the proof is that nothing moves itself. And you might come up with examples of, of 
things moving themselves. Probably the the clearest thing, an example of something move itself moving itself is is an animal, or maybe you could say a human being coming to choose something. I'm, I'm I move myself to choose a, having a can of Coke with lunch or whatever. Um, the thing is that Aquinas's particular claim to make it more precise, and I think therefore clearer, is that uh, anything that is moved is moved with respect to some terminus. There is an end to the change. It's You're changing from X into Y. So anything that enables X to become Y uh, already ha- is, is actual with respect to Y. So, uh, you know, the pot on the stove that's heating up is able to be heated by something that already has heat. So whenever you ask the question, well, does something move itself? The best way to respond is to ask, well, what is the subject of the change? And then when you identify the change in question, well, it's a paw, a a dog's paw moving forward or something like that. Then you can, once you identify the motion that you're talking about, the change that you're talking about, then it becomes clear what the subject is. And you can isolate the subject that is undergoing that change and recognize that it is simply a part of the whole. And then you can... Uh, ask, well, what is causing that change to happen? And it's inevitably another part of the same whole. Yeah. And when you get to the question, you know, you made reference to the fact that human beings are free to choose uh, and that we do choose um, and that we might exteriorize or externalize that choice by thought or word or deed. Um, But that might be, in our own experience, the most concentrated example of a thing that looks like self-movement. And from a certain vantage, it is self-movement, but that requires, um, you know, a superordinated causal explanation. So maybe, I don't know if you can walk through that a little bit. Well, I mean, if we're going to say that human behavior is rational or uh, that it, it's that human choices are intelligible, I'll put it like this. Every time you do something, as a result of, of choice, you can always ask somebody, why did you do that? And when the person answers that question, you can say, well, why did you want to do that? And, and so on. You know, why did you get up this morning to go to work? Why did you go to work to make money? Why did you make money? Because, well, I like buying fancy new technology, whatever the answer is. Eventually, you're going to, according to Aquinas, you're going to get to the answer, well, I, I want to be happy. Uh, I, I want fulfillment. Uh, I have I have metaphysical as uh, we can put it in natural law terms. I have metaphysical inclination that uh, that as an incomplete being that inclined me towards fulfillment. And so, although as you say, we we are in a sense self movers. We are free to make choices. We're not free not to want happiness. We all want to be happy. So that is for Aquinas a fundamental inclination of the will and anything that we understand that is essentially connected to our happiness is something that we're going to want. And um, th- in that respect, we're not free. That is fixed by our nature. So that indicates that the movement of the will is itself dependent on our nature, which is something that God gave us. I don't make myself to be a human, right? Um, God gave me a particular nature. So even even those choices where I appear to be moving myself to something, though I am moving myself towards something, but those movements are understood in, in light of something prior that gives my will uh, and causal efficacy to do those things. So even even those motions are are dependent on God. Yeah. And and this is another place in which the relationship between the metaphysical and the epistemological comes to the fore. Because when people, you know, trace the happiness argument that you just described, they often are content to just leave it at a psychological phenomenon. It's like, yeah, I basically want nice things. It's like, no, no, no. It's not just a matter of wanting nice things. It's a matter of being ordered to the assimilation of goods, which fill out your nature. Because nature, you know, within the context of the same conversation in Aristotle's physics, is a principle of motion or rest, and that to which it pertains per se and not per accidents. So it's like you, on account of the fact that you are this type of thing, have been launched forth from metaphysical canon towards your terminus. <laughs> That's one way of putting it, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like not, you know, you can reflect on your experience as you hurdle towards your end in better and worse ways, but it's the fact of the hurdling is something that runs deeper. And so 
you know, like when you examine this uh, per se subordinated series of causes, we're talking about things, you know, with natures. And as a result of which, like you said, there are things like this is more disposed than that is to become a house because of what it is. And so the reduction of a thing from potency to act represents not just any old change, but it represents typically the fulfillment of a nature. So when we, again, like as we think about how this argument leads to subsequent clarifications about God, you know, chapter, well, I mean, our, here we go, Gregory, <laughs> uh, Prima Pars question six is about the goodness of God. Um, and he's going to mine insights from those arguments to arrive at the God who in, you know, his goodness makes us or orders us to a goodness befitting our nature, which, um, yeah, again, like, it helps you in a certain sense to appreciate the setting and context of the arguments. They're not just like, yeah, the proofs of an aloof logician. They are, yeah, they have this rich, um, you know, rich setting within a theology of creation. Um, okay, so coming coming then to the end of the argument, we arrive at a God who, so we, we use this principle that you described, everything that is moved is moved by another. We arrive at one who is not moved. Um, can you describe that that last step, how it how it transpires? Well, the thing is that, uh, you know, going back to the Dawkins or Hitchens argument, um, or I, I think it was actually best articulated by Carl Sagan, who said, well, you know, if you ask where the universe came from, you might appeal to a creator. And if you appeal to a creator, then you have to ask, well, who created the creator? And so it's just more parsimonious uh it's 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 more neat and efficient to just say well the universe just exists um and the thing is that that does miss the point of this kind of proof because what aquinas is saying is that every member of the causal chain when you're looking at something changing something else has this dependence on other things and if we keep appealing to something if, if every time we're trying to explain a change, we keep appealing to something else that requires an explanation, then we end up with this, what he calls the infinite regress, this impossible infinity of dependent causes. You can't have an infinity of dependency because then the, the infinity itself is dependent. It needs and itself needs an explanation. So in order to resolve this problem, we have to posit the existence of something that is not dependent uh, on on anything else for its causal efficacy. It just has causal efficacy. And what's that? Well, the reason why everything else is de is dependent is because it, it is in some sense in act and it is in potency in other respects. And there's something else that shifts it from being an act in one respect to and being an act in a different respect. So in order for something to be able to change other things, it has to be an act. And in order for it uh, not to have any dependency on something else for its own causal efficacy, it can't have potency. So we arrive at the uh, existence of something that is just pure act, doesn't have potency at all. And something that is pure act can affect any change it wants because it has all the actuality that it would ever need to do that. Uh, and it itself does not require uh, the, you deposit anything else to explain why it's able to do that because since it doesn't lack potency, it, since it doesn't have potency, it doesn't need anything else to move it from being an act in one respect to act in another respect because it is an act in every respect. So now we've got this thing that doesn't require anything else to explain, uh, why it's able to do what it does. Uh, and that Aquinas thinks it's self evident at this point. Well, that's gotta be God. <laughs> Um, okay. Maybe, maybe just by way of a last question, unless a further last question occurs to me, they'll both be a last question in intention, whether or not they will be a last <laughs> question. In fact, that remains to be seen. Um, but uh, obviously St. Thomas keeps going, right? Yeah. So he goes on to describe four other ways in the Summa Theologiae, and then people identify any number of additional arguments in parallel texts or just other texts. Um, so why, you know, like, what does that add or how does that benefit the reader? Well, so with the first way, for example, we arrive at the conclusion not only that God exists, but that God is changeless. Um, I think it also follows from this first proof that God is omnipotent because he has, like, potency is said in two respects. For Aristotle, there's the, there's, um, the first meaning of potency is 
something's ability to be changed by something else. But the second is something's ability to change other things. So that's where the, our English word power comes from. If I have power, it means I'm able to do other things. So God being pure act and lacking potency in the first sense has every potency in the second sense. In other words, what he's able to do is affect any change. And that's where omnipotency, all potency comes from. So now we have an eternal and omnipotent God at the end of the first proof. The end of the second proof is not uh, based on change. It's based on uh, generation, com the coming to be of things, making, making things to exist. What we would call efficient causality rather than um, <clears throat> the first proof. Uh, well, you could look at, you know, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. Uh, what I'll say is that the, the the second proof is based clearly on efficient causality, not things changing, but things coming to be. And how is it that things come to be? Well, uh, things have uh, things that do not exist, or that but that could exist have uh, potential existence, and then they are given existence by something that has existence. So uh, what we have to the, the distinction that we have to draw in order to make sense out of this is the one between essence and existence. There's, uh, uh, you know, uh, I could uh, make something and that thing, potentially speaking, has an essence so we can describe what it would be, even though it doesn't exist. So what something is and that something is are two different things. Uh, so if we have a series of, of causal changes as in the first way, but instead of being uh, a, a, a causal series understood in terms of, uh, of, of changers, changers changing other things, we have a causal series of generators. And what generators do is they, they sort of unite essence and existence. They take a, a, an essence that something of something that could exist and they endow it with existence. But then each thing is, each thing in the chain also depends on something else or its ability to do that, just like the first way. But at the end of the second way, what we get to is something that does not depend on anything for its existence. So now we have the conclusion that God's being is existence, just as we had gotten in the first way to the conclusion that, you know, if we're going to explain a series of changers, uh, or we, we, need to ex we need to posit the existence of something that is changeless. So in the second way, when we posit the existence, uh, when, we're, when we're talking about a series of generators, we have to uh, posit the existence of an ultimate generator that is not itself generated. And why isn't it generated? Because it needs nothing uh, to unite its essence and existence because they're already united. And then, you know, like you, you can you can look at each of the ways and, and uh, glean something new about God from them. Uh, God is a necessary being, right? Uh, God is all good. Um, I'm trying to think of the other ones, but anyway, you get you get the idea. Yeah. No, I guess um, as you describe the second way, the way in which the second way supplements the first way, I think of further implications for the spiritual life um, in the sense that um, sometimes people think about prayer as like changing God's mind. Oh, right. Yeah. Um, which is a perilous prospect because if he needs his mind changed, then salvation is, well, maybe not. <laughs> it depends as on you, not on him, thing. if that's what he needs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but when you think about it this way, it really just, it flips the causal understanding on its head as it ought to be. Uh, I think it was G.K. Chester who said of St. Francis of Assisi, you know, like the, the tumbler of Our Lady that when standing on his head, he saw the world best for what it was. <laughs> um, so, uh, we see it in so far as like God gives things to be and that he includes us within this causal chain, which he could execute directly, but in a certain sense to be subordinated to him as a generator. You know, you have it on your heart to pray for the conversion of somebody close to you that is brought about. God, God can and does bring that about, right? And he, he could bring it about directly. He chooses to implicate us in so far as it makes us like him, right? It makes us like him in so far as he is a generator by right and we are generators subordinated there and too. Um, that sounds kind of like, I don't know, somewhat neutral, uh, or somewhat, um, what kind of abstract terminology, but the idea that, that God implicates us in his designs of mercy so that we might participate, generally share in the distribution of his mercy insofar as the goal is to be like him. Um, it's pretty, it's pretty wild. And we're just talking about the five ways, you know, you just, 
you're a question too. And you've got a lot more besides. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and I, I think, but I also think we haven't even exhausted the, the implications of the spiritual life for the first way. And I think a big one, for example, is that we do arrive at an eternal God at the end of the first way. And one of the objections to the first way that I've heard is, well, you say, you say that this thing is pure act, this prime mover, this this ultimate being or God is is, is pure act. Uh, but God, but you also say that the universe came to exist at a particular point. So doesn't that mean that God decided one day to create the universe? And wouldn't that imply a change in God? And Aquinas' response to this is brilliant. He says, well, that assumes an agent acting in time. Mm -hmm. And so it's question begging. And changing one's will uh, is not the same thing as, as willing eternally. So, so willing to change is different from changing one's will. And God, eternal from all eternity, can will to create a universe in time. And it's never the case that he uh, uh, didn't will this way. So the plan, has the plan for creation has always been. You know, everything that exists was eternally planned by God and came from God's mind. It's uh, it's it's wonderful. It is. I'm actually I'm reading Saint Augustine's Confessions right now for um, a podcast, and um, I just came to that part where he describes. I think Saint Saint Thomas is drawing on Saint Augustine the idea okay. that the will to change is not the change of a will. So yeah, which well, is, I got it in Aquinas, but he probably got it from Augustine. So exactly, yeah. yeah. Sometimes when I um, there are a couple of places in which I preach where it is thought that the citation of St. Thomas Aquinas might be a little bit, you know, hoity-toity. Mm. So I usually, I just keep doing exactly what I ordinarily do, but then I just cite the people that St. Thomas cites. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Uh, okay. Well, thanks so much for, uh, for taking the time. Yeah, for the thank patience, you for having me. Um, yeah, and unpacking the, uh, in the first way. Um, yeah, if people want to read more, it seems like your, your principal object or area of study is ethics, St. Thomas's account of the passions and things like that. Are there places in which they can follow up with you and your work? Oh, well, uh, if you just, I mean, not many people in the world have my name. So if you just Google it, you'll find my, uh, um, my professional profile and uh, my CV is there. So a list of all my published works and so on is found right there at St. Mary's okay. website. Okay. I went on like a, a passions reading kick at one point. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it it actually counts as a passions reading kick, but I read the minor book and the Lombardo book. So I look forward to reading, uh, yeah, reading more oh, about the passions. Oh, great. Well, thank you. Thank you. So, uh, all right. So uh, to you listener, thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Off Campus Conversations. If you haven't yet, please do subscribe to the Thomistic Institute podcast, either on your podcast app or on YouTube. So that way you can get updates when future great things come forth. Um, yeah. So know of our prayers for you. Please pray for us. And we will catch you next time on the Thomistic Institute podcast.